I'm going to start with a, a land acknowledgement. Um, so we will begin by giving honor and thanks to the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations as the traditional inhabitants of the lands where McMaster stands. To say that is to acknowledge a debt to those who were here before us and to recognize our responsibility as guests to respect and honor the intimate relationship Indigenous peoples have to this land. So again, I'm going to be moderating today's session. My name is Tara Kajax and I'm the program manager for the COVID Immunity Study. Uh, today um, and every day I have the absolute privilege of working with a team of over 45 people to make sure that we use all of the information in every drop of blood donated by our participants to contribute to the global effort to understand COVID-19 and to help residents of long-term care retirement homes and assisted, li assisted living homes um, uh, be protected from this virus. So uh, tonight we do have Dr. Dawn Bowdish here. She's one of uh, the, the two project scientific leads that we have. Um, and she is a Canadian immunologist and a professor in the Department of Medicine at McMaster University. She's also a Canadian research chair in aging and immunity, as well as the executive director of the Firestone Institute for Respiratory Health at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton. Dr. Bowdish and her team study the aging immune system. Specifically, they work to uncover how the immune system and the microbes that live in and on us interact to prevent infections to COVID-19 and pneumonia, to give older adults more years of healthy, independent living. As I mentioned, Dawn, Dr. Don Bowdish is uh, the co-lead for this study, uh, and she co-leads it with Dr. Andrew Costa, who's the Schlegel Research Chair in Clinical Epidemiology and Aging, and an associate professor in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact, as well as the Department of Medicine at McMaster University. He serves as the scientific director of the St. Joseph's Center for Integrated Care, and he's an associate director of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. His program of research makes use of health information to target, develop, and evaluate models of care in home and community care, emergency departments, hospitals, and long-term care. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Bowdish um, for your presentation. Thank you so much. And can you see the slides again? Okay, Tara? Yes. You can't, great. Now I can't see you, so um, make sure that if you would like to interrupt and ask a question that I'm sure Tara and Lindsay will, will tell me what to do. So I thought um, I would start today by actually giving a big thank you back to you as the listeners for this. I was on a, a investigator meeting for one of the other studies on COVID I run, and I really realized that the investigators in that study were not nearly as savvy about communication and about giving the participants the, the data that they needed to make good decision. And I realized that one of the reasons our study has been so um, effective at changing policy, about implementing the, the research findings we have into practice, is because you and I have this history of communication. You and I, my listener, uh, you ask the tough questions. And by sh asking those questions, it helps really direct us into doing the right research and, and providing the right results. So I acknowledge and express my gratitude that our, this relationship you and I have of uh, this conversation is one that's really led to the study's success and I honor it and I cherish it and I'll be sad should it ever end. Okay, um, for those of you who've met me before, uh, you will know that before COVID I had lovely non-gray hair and you know was more cheerful um, and my research interests like I said like uh, Tara said rather was studying infections and immune responses in older adults and at the beginning of the pandemic Obviously, I was really distraught by the incredible burden of infections and really wanted to do something about it. Luckily, uh, I got the, I had the honor and privilege of meeting Andrew, who's been studying the long-term care sector for a while and built some really wonderful partnerships. And together, we co-lead this incredible study called the COVID and Long-Term Care Study. But in truth, it's not uh, a study of two geeky scientists. It's a study of incredibly committed research coordinators, participants, and staff. Over 45 people have been employed in the study, everything from research technicians and technologists to study coordinators to scientists. And I often think about the incredible brain power we've been able to harness uh, to put towards this, this project, and I'm incredibly proud of everyone's involvement. 
we have had at our peak 26 homes involved in the project uh, that have been providing samples. And the fact that there's so many different homes has allowed us to help make really good estimates about what's happening in the province of Ontario. Just now. Okay. At our peak, we had almost 1,500 participants in the study, and this has been uh, dropping off a little bit. Uh, some We've lost some of our participants due to attrition, and we're now at around uh, 500, which is still a fairly remarkable number of study participants, considering we ask people to give blood every three months or so. I'm going to give you the take-home message, and then we'll walk through the data. As you've probably realized by the number of outbreaks in the homes that you live or work in, the pandemic isn't over. And the bad news is it isn't going to be over anytime soon. The good news is that the vaccines do work, but they're going to need a little help for masking, testing, and other measures, at least while we're still in the Omicron era. These are numbers of infections that we've had. The black bars are in long-term care and the gray bars are in retirement homes. And what you can see is that the very left side of the graph during the first few waves, uh, some of our participants had infections in that time and you can sort of see the Delta wave, um, the gamma wave, but really when Omicron hit, we experienced in long-term care and retirement participants, just like in the general community, a huge increase in the number of infections, and these are ongoing. And here's a little timeline of what this sort of looks like. So if you look in May 2020, of course, there were some uh, outbreaks uh, that proceeded through the rest of the year. And over Christmas, when people were mixing in January, we saw a big spike. We had a little bit of a slow period in the summer of 2021. But then as we reached November, when Omicron hit, we start to see that there are many more. And again, after Christmas being a huge spike in infection numbers in the general population and also in the long term care sector. To put this in another way, this is the most recent data from the province of Ontario, which shows uh, the number of outbreaks in long term care and retirement homes. And again, you can see on the left hand side, the incredible number uh, of deaths that occurred in the first wave was comparatively due to a small number of outbreaks. And when we hit the Omicron era in 2022 there, we see that the number of outbreaks uh, sort of undulates in this three month pattern. Because of all these outbreaks, we're actually at a point where we're starting to see repeat infections in our participants. So of the 1,500 uh, participants in our study, about 60% of them have had at least one COVID infection. And you can see that that's a whole range of different variants depending on where they got that first infection. But some of those people have moved on to having second infections, third infections, and some participants even more than that. We know that having had a COVID infection is not protective against future infections, although we now know that having a COVID infection with the protection of a vaccine behind you probably helps extend the period by which you're protected. This terrible number of outbreaks and the fact that some of our participants, despite their incredible commitment to vaccination, has led people to ask the question, are our vaccines even working if we're still getting sick? And will we have to keep getting vaccinated forever? The answer is yes and yes. Again, this shows the undulating pattern of these COVID waves. So if we look on the left-hand side, we see hospitalizations, uh, especially in older adults, were very high. Those are the green. Um, then we saw this period in the summer where we still had plenty of restrictions happening. When those started to get lift in October, we had the second big wave, and then we had a little blip, and then we had a really nice quiet period in uh, July 2022. But when Omicron hit in uh, November 2021, you can see that we had this huge jump in hospitalizations in all age groups, although, of course, older adults bore the burden. And again, I want you to take a note of that undulating three-month pattern. All data suggests 
that we can continue to expect these waves between every three and six months, as long as we're in the Omicron era. Unlike the previous versions of the virus, having had an Omicron infection only gives your immune system a little bump. And our current vaccines are less good at protecting from infections than earlier versions. So what happens is a variant comes in, it infects everybody who's vulnerable because their vaccines are out of date or because they're immunocompromised or because they haven't been vaccinated. That group of people declines. There's a, this little period of uh, low infection rates, a new variant comes in, and again, it could squeak under those immune responses. There are parts of the world that are further along their pandemic than we are, and they also show this undulating three-month pattern of infections. So we can reasonably expect that also to be the case in Canada. The second thing, and I think equally problematic, but important thing I want you to take away from this graph, the peaks are high, but the valleys are getting higher too. Unlike in the early part of the pandemic, where effectively we could get hospitalizations to low or none in those times we had really restrictive measures, in the Omicron era, we don't have the same degree of protections that we had previously. And so even in the good times, they're still pretty bad. I've had uh, people compare it to a rising tide. You know, it's a rising tide that means even when back, uh, infections are um, comparatively low, they're still much higher than we would have found acceptable at earlier points in the pandemic. Our data also supports this three month time period. When Omicron first hit in November uh, 2021, we wanted to understand what, what could protect us. Could anything protect us? I mean, I, I don't know if you remember, but we were um, so deeply concerned that uh, what we might see would be uh, all the vaccines becoming ineffective and all the drugs becoming ineffective. Fortunately, that wasn't the case. We looked to see uh, what features protected. So if the little dot is on the left side, my left, your side, yeah, of the uh, red line, it means less uh, infections and on the right side, it means more. One of the recommendations we'd made from our studies is that Moderna vaccines have more mRNA in them and seem to induce stronger immune responses in older adults. And so at the time, uh, it, was apparent that the more Moderna you had in your mix, uh, the better you could do for that, the stronger the vaccine, uh, the immune response was. When Omicron was present, there was an immediate push to get older adults and vulnerable people vaccinated. And so many of our participants had the good fortune of getting vaccinated right before there were outbreaks in their homes. And having had that fourth dose was seen to be a major feature that uh, reduce the risk of becoming infected. But again, what we found, just in like those graphs I just showed you, is that having had a previous COVID infection gave you no more than three months worth of protection. Having had, you know, an uh, infection in the first or second wave or six months ago did not provide any additional protection. And how I tell people to interpret these data is if there's a 12 month calendar year, you get about three months of protection from an infection, and you get between three and six months of protection from a vaccination. If you've just been uh, infected, oftentimes you can wait a little bit to get your vaccine to give you three months or six months and give you a bit more coverage. There are, of course, exceptions to this. People who are immunosuppressed or um, if an outbreak is pending, it may be a good uh, idea for them to compress that timeline. But the take home message here is you get no more than three months of protection from a previous infection, unfortunately. And this has led to so much frustration about these vaccines. We had all hoped it would be like measles. You get your measles vaccine and you never worry about measles again. But in truth, it's turned out to be much closer to influenza. Here, what we're looking at are the vaccine effectiveness against COVID-19. 
And in the orange dots and bars, we're looking at Omicron, and in the blue, we're looking at the pre-Omicron level. The bottom on the y-axis is the number of days since vaccination. And you can see if we think about Omicron, that you start with about 60% of effectiveness against, uh, against illness, and then that decreases every month by about 10 or so percent. And by the time you get to 10 or 12 months out, you're effectively not protected from infection anymore. For many people, they find this disheartening, but I always say it is exactly the same as influenza. Influenza vaccines in a good year start at about 60% protection from a symptomatic infection and a much higher rate of protection against hospitalization and severe outcomes. But every month that protection goes down by about 10 percent the canadian flu season lasts about five months so you only need one vaccine for influenza to protect you for the whole flu season but if we had two waves a year you would need a second vaccine as well so the rate at which this protection wanes for covid is really no different than many of our other vaccines it's just frustrating because there's so much covid around and it's coming at us so quickly that it feels like we can never really get ahead now oftentimes i hear your frustration you tell me these things and i understand how frustrating it must be because a lot of people are saying to me, if vaccines don't stop me from getting sick, why should I even bother getting another one? And I can tell you, I am as up to date on my vaccines as I can possibly be for the following reasons. This graph here shows that the amount of virus that is in you um, is the lowest if you've been recently vaccinated and highest if your vaccine was a long time ago, in this case, about a year. In the blue, we've got the pre-Omicron variant, and then the red, we've got the Omicron variant. If you're vaccinated and you get infected shortly after, your risk of having any symptoms at all is lower. But even if you do get those symptoms, the amount of virus in you will be lower. This is important because we know that even though this infection starts in your lungs, this virus can attack and fight other organs. And more virus means more severe symptoms. More severe symptoms means more likelihood of other parts of your body being damaged by the virus and the possibility of long-term health effects. As an example, there was just an enormous study in the country of Israel. And what they did is they looked at people who had COVID infections, admittedly in the pre-Omicron era, and they looked to see what health conditions they still had weeks and months afterwards, or in some case they developed weeks and months afterwards. And they found that older adults, people who were over 60 years old, who'd had a COVID infection, were more likely to have a cough, chest pain, hair loss, and weakness. Importantly, a second study showed that people who were vaccinated were much less likely to have heart attacks, strokes, and other events. Again, this is a virus that loves to attack the heart, the blood vessels of your brain, many parts of the body. Having an infection increases the risk of the damage of those parts of the body, and if you're recently vaccinated, you reduce that risk because you reduce the amount of virus and the amount of damage that it can do. So even if you still get an infection, having a vaccine can help deal with many of these long-term health issues. The next reason is that, oh, and before, sorry. This is one of my favorite pieces of art because it combines my love for art and my love for infectious disease. This is the Edvard Munch's self-portrait after the Spanish flu. For those of you who don't know him, he's the artist who made that famous portrait, The Scream. And he lived it through the 1918-1919 pandemic. Then, as now, 
people who survived the infection often had long and lasting health issues that they couldn't shake. And here he paints his own convalescence and his challenges. He went through a period where he was not very productive for the years after his infection because he was feeling so poorly. So long-term health effect, effects after any serious respiratory uh, infection can occur, but vaccination can help prevent them. And this seems to be particularly important in the context of COVID. Going back to the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic, there was this association found between the original virus infection and getting a second infection close afterwards. COVID-19 has this capacity as well. The data I'm showing here is from a, a study I'm sort of peripherally involved in by colleagues at the Ottawa Hospital. And they studied people who got COVID versus everyone was over 60, so long-term care homes and retirement homes. And they looked at people who got COVID or people who got COVID and had had a recent vaccination. The thing they were looking for was the number of antibiotic prescriptions that occurred in these two groups. Sometimes it's hard for, my, for us to understand who's had an infection or not if they don't go to the hospital or if they don't go to the doctor, but by counting the number of antibiotic prescriptions, we can get a sense of how bad someone's infection is and if they they have a bacterial infection on top of the virus infection because you don't get antibiotics for covid that's not it's a virus you don't get antibiotics for but if you have covid and you get pneumonia or a urinary tract infection or some other skin infection or something on top of that you'll be likely to get antibiotics what they found was that people who had not had a recent vaccine were two to four times more likely to get an antibiotic prescription, meaning that they were getting multiple sicknesses in this short time period. This is really important because first of all, we don't want people to be needing so many antibiotics. And second of all, it means they're getting sort of doubly sick and that can make it particularly difficult to get better, especially when you're older. Like I said, this phenomenon of having a virus and having to mount this very, very strong inflammatory response to deal with that virus has been known for decades. And what happens as you start to get better is this, this response dips below normal levels. And in that period, you can become more vulnerable to other infections. You may have experienced this in your personal life. Sometimes people say to me, oh, you know, I had a cold and then it got into my lungs or, you know, you have that feeling of like you got over something minor and then something else happened right after it. Very, very common and can be really problematic. And to show you another nice piece of art, uh, Gustav Klimt was another artist who lived during the 1918-1919 uh, influenza pandemic. And he didn't die of the influenza he died of post-influenza pneumonia. So this phenomena of having a viral infection and then getting something else has existed for a long time. And it also occurs in the context of COVID, but getting vaccinated can help reduce those chances of having that secondary infection. We've also seen a little bit of strange evidence in our own study that indicates this might be the case. You may or may not remember because it's all alphabet soup, the first Omicron infections to come to the province of Ontario were sort of BA1, BA2, they were called. And then there was another one called BA5. What we saw is that this BA1 sort of swept through our homes and then the BA5 one followed. We saw a very strange phenomena where people who just had a BA1 or 2 infection um, were more likely to get a BA5 infection than people who hadn't had one of those first infections. So basically they got two Omicrons right in a row. We don't understand why this is, but we suspect that through some viral trickery or some problem with uh, immune responses to the first Omicron, people weren't able to generate a really strong and protective immune response against the second one. We're trying to figure this out, but we think this is really important because again, it speaks to the desire and need to reduce the number of these infections overall so that one infection doesn't lead to another infection, doesn't lead to another infection uh, and make our residents uh, ill.
more ill than they need to be. You may remember early in the pandemic, there was this dream that we all had that COVID would become a seasonal virus. It would be like the flu, it would come once a year, you know, maybe we'd batten down the hatches and uh, we would deal with it that way and then it would go away and we'd all have a lovely summer and we wouldn't have to think about infections or vaccine. If that was the case, maybe it would make sense to move to getting vaccinated just once a year, one wave, just like influenza. I'm sorry to say, but this looks like wishful thinking. There is no evidence that COVID will become a seasonal virus in the foreseeable future. And in fact, that's not so abnormal. The, on the top left there, that's sort of the seasonal virus pattern for the Northern Hemisphere like Canada. So you tend to get peaks around January and low points. But even in parts of the Northern Hemisphere that have more tropical or humid uh, areas, they're kind of even all throughout the year with no clear flu season. If we look and see, that's sort of Australia where their winter is our summer and vice versa. So they have uh, their peaks um, in sort of their winter months. But they have a different pattern if, if it's in a more tropical area. So there is no rule that a virus must become a seasonal virus. And COVID doesn't seem to need the extra help of dry air and low humidity that some of the viruses like influenza needs. It seems to be well adapted enough to infect people that it doesn't really need any help. And that's why we see these three month undulating patterns um, that are expected to continue into the foreseeable future. Just to give you a look at what a normal virus looks like, um, this is what influenza looks like. It's a busy graph, so I'll walk you through it. Those thick gray bars there, those are what influenza rates look like in normal years, pre-pandemic years. Um, so you can see they sort of jump up in December, January, grandchildren kissing all their grandparents. You know, there's always a little bit of a jump after the holidays sort of a protracted period until March, and then we see things sort of fading away until we get to the summer months. Now, during 2020, 2021, there is no, the red line shows there were no infections. We were doing a great job at, um, at really uh, social distancing and masking, and Canada effectively didn't have a flu season. Now, last year, there was a little bit of simmering influenza around. There was a little bit more travel. There was a little bit less restrictions. And when we lifted those restrictions in March, we saw this very unusual jump in infections. And again, this speaks to the fact if you have enough vulnerable people, you don't need the help of the winter season to cause a spike in infections. Now this year, if you look on the left side, was the blue, it came a little bit early. And again, we lifted everything all at once and there was lots of circulating. Um, and so our, our flu season came this. And I show this to you to show sort of what normal looks like, but to show you that normal can really vary depending on our behaviors, masking, and we had record few outbreaks in long-term care for influenza when we compare to the burden of how much influenza there was around. Um, and that was because of masking and you know our cautions of staying away when we're sick. We should be able to use our learnings from this pandemic to continue to keep influenza infections low in long-term care and retirement communities, even if we will be struggling with COVID for a long, long time. And again, just to show you in contrast of what normal looks like uh, for COVID, we see these undulating waves about every three months. Vaccines that we have are not going to give us the perfect measles-like immunity. They're just not. But we can do things to use them better. As I said, one of the major recommendations our studies made, which we know has been really effective, is using the right vaccine for older adults. The Moderna vaccine has more of the mRNA in it, and the aging immune system needs to, that little bit of a kick to help produce a really strong response. Can use the right vaccine, but we can also time our vaccines to get best effect. What I'm about to say sounds so obvious, but believe it or not, it's not common practice. 
getting vaccinated right before you're most likely to get infected provides the biggest bang for its buck. So as soon as we see those waves going up, if we went in with a really strong vaccination campaign, like we did with third doses in the Delta wave, we see the steepest drop off. It's less effective to vaccinate sort of higgly piggly or when rates are low. And that's because by the time, you know, that wave starts up again, if you're at the end of your period of protection, you're not going to get the maximal benefit. So we need studies like ours to help monitor these outbreaks and make good decisions about when to get vaccinated. And I know a lot of our participants have reached out and said, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, I have to go for surgery or I'm planning the holiday of a lifetime. Those are good times to get vaccinated because, they'll, again, they'll give you that premium protection right before uh, whatever it is that you would want, not want to get sick for. We now know that having had a previous infection gives no more than three months of protection, even if you've got a strong basis of vaccination in your back pocket. And vaccination really seems to only protect from symptomatic infection in older adults for three to six months. So we need to really think about using these time periods effectively to get maximal protection. The bivalent vaccine has shows a lot of promise, but it's still not perfect. What I'm showing you here is the infections we've been tracking after fourth dose in black. So those are days or weeks rather since the person got vaccinated and with the fifth dose. And again, we can sort of see that there is a little bit of a creep up after uh, some time has passed, after we're nearing that sort of three month period. So using these vaccines effectively um, is going to be really, really key to making sure that we keep people as protected as long as we can. We are also entering a really unusual time period in the Omicron uh, world. We had complete takeover by previous variants. First, there was the ancestral and then Alpha wiped it out and then Delta wiped that out. And then we hit Omicron and Omicron wiped out all the previous ones. But now if you look at where we are in at the very um, right hand side of the graph, um, there's many different variants in circulation at the same time. I showed you some data about having had a BA1 infection didn't seem to be super protective against a BA5 infection. And we now really understand that we need to understand interactions between these viruses. If you get infected with one of them, will you truly be protected or will you be more vulnerable? What happens if you get two in close succession? Do the vaccines, do they work better against some of the variants and not others? We'll be continuing to monitor this to better understand how to use these appropriately to get maximal protection. We are seeing pandemic fatigue in our participants of this, I am sure. We had almost 100% uptake for dose one and dose two, dose three. Started to see a little bit of reduction in people dose four saying, I'm just done. I don't want another one of these. And the fact that we're only at 70% vaccinated with the fifth dose causes me some sleepless nights because it means that our messaging about how important it is to keep up with vaccines isn't being taken up. And that means we have more people vulnerable to both the infections and the long-term health consequences that come with infections and the chance of having a secondary unrelated infection. We need to make sure that our communication is solid and we stress the importance of keeping up to date with these vaccines. I've got my fifth dose. And I think you should too. Before we enter the Q&A, which is my favorite part of these talks, I'd like to let you know what we're going to continue to do, at least uh, hopefully till uh, fall this year and maybe longer if we are able to get some more funding. We need to understand what this Omicron era is going to look like or continue to look like. What can we do to stop that undulating three month uh, uh, series of outbreaks? Can we use the vaccines any more effectively? Is there more to learn? Can we test next generation vaccines and see what the future is going to look like? Can we continue to advise governments about when to vaccinate people to get maximum effect? We also know that a significant, about 40% of our participants haven't had an infection yet. 
and the 60% who do, do seem to be getting a longer period of protection for most uh, cases. Understanding this will help us make predictions about how vaccines and infections work together to contribute to protection. Unfortunately, like I said, it looks like three to six months is going to be the ma magic frequency of these waves, but there are still some unanswered questions about how these different variants interact that may extend or shorten those periods, and we need to be prepared. We're also beginning studies to understand how having had any of these infections might compromise our participants' health, because obviously this is a, something that's very, very worrisome. We want to be as healthy as we can for as long as we can. And we'll continue to keep fighting and advocating to make sure that we're getting the best use of the vaccines we have, because right now they're one very important tool. Like I said, though, they still need some help with other practices to reduce infections, including masking, testing, and being vigilant. So with that, I just want to thank our incredible uh, research coordinators. I am so pleased to have gotten to speak to these people and hear about their experiences doing our work. Uh, Julie um, is going to be taking over, uh, taking a leadership role and helping coordinate some of these things. We have email address that you can reach her at if you or someone you care for would like to be involved in the study. Um, and we will continue to work towards serving you best. Uh, by doing some wonderful science with your samples. I just want to thank you so, so much on behalf of the entire COVID and LTC team for being with me here today.